Good morning. How we doing today? Happy to be here? Let's go. All right. Have y'all been here the last few weeks? We've been going back to faith school, right? Back to faith school. Well, Pastor Nate's not here today. I'm your substitute, <laughs> Professor Parker, and we're going to school. Did someone say weird? <laughs> it is weird. Uh, we are going to school today. Uh, hey, if you don't know, my name is Landon. I'm the executive pastor here at Beyond Church. Pastors Nate and Evan, they got to take a little uh, short trip over the holiday weekend to see their family up north. They send their love. They love you guys. They'll be back, I think, uh, Monday or Tuesday morning. Uh, so you get me today, substitute. Uh, there will be no slacking off. I'm not one of those substitutes. We're going we're gonna to get after it this morning and uh, pick up where we left off. How many of you have been blessed by uh, this series so far? It's been really good. I mean, honestly, it, it's a really cool uh, premise for what Pastor Nate came up with because you can tie in um, so much of what we know about going back to school and school in general to God's Word. And what it does is it helps us apply God's Word, right, uh, which is the, it's the point. So if we're not applying God's word, then what are we doing with it? So it's super helpful. And I want to do a little bit of review because that's what we do in school. If you don't review, guess what? You're not going to catch what you need to get. And so we want to go over what we talked about. How many of you know what we talked about on week one of Back to Faith School? The textbook. We talked about the textbook, which is the Bible, the word of God. Uh, that is what we talked about uh, week one. You know, there is only one book that produces faith. There's just one. There's one. So when we're talking about faith school, when we're, there, there can only be one textbook. You don't have to have a back, back, backpack filled with all. No one knows what we're talking about anymore. I know. We don't have textbooks anymore. Uh, used to, you know, I had my backpack filled with multiple textbooks. And then you had a locker. I don't know what you guys use lockers for anymore if you don't put books in them. What do we put in lockers nowadays? They don't get lockers. Yeah, wow. Well, it's people, some people get lockers, don't they? Yeah, what do y'all put in there? Just candy? I don't know. Anyway, but you used to have to put books in your backpack and carry them around. There's only one book that we need at faith school. That's the Bible. It is the only book that can produce faith. The only one. Uh, and we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, this should be familiar to you, but we know there's only one way that faith comes, and how is it? It comes from hearing and hearing the word of God, okay? Some translations say, and to be more specific, it comes from hearing about Jesus. It comes from hearing the words of Jesus, from Jesus, right? And so we know this is how faith comes. It comes from the textbook. Uh, one of the other things that Pastor Nate talked about that, that week in week one is how God is wanting to grow us. God, we're not just meant to be where we're at right now. God is wanting to grow us up, and he uses the Holy Spirit to do that, to sow the word into our lives so that it would produce a harvest in our lives, right? And if we know anything, we know this from Mark chapter 4, that the enemy is after one thing. What's he after? He's after the word. The enemy, Satan, he comes to steal the word that's been planted in your heart. That's what he's after. Uh, how many know if that's what he's after, it must be really important. That's right. that's it must be really valuable. Uh, a thief only steals what's valuable if you're a good thief. Right. If you're a stupid thief, you steal stupid stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but if you're a good thief, you go after what's valuable. Right. And he knows that is the most valuable, the most precious thing that he can get because only the word of God, only God's word will bring faith. And faith is required, Pastor Austin brought this up, faith is required in order to please God. Yes. It is. Uh, so faith must have a foundation, and this is why the word is being attacked. It's why the devil hates God's word. He's been lying and questioning humanity for thousands of years when it comes to God's word. And one of the most amazing points that I remember from week one was from an example that Pastor Nate gave from a movie he was, he was kind of... Uh, he didn't really want to share, but it was from Bloodsport. <laughs> you all remember this? And he was talking about the guy who, who had something in his hand. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically he had something in his hand, and he said, I'm going to take that from your hand. And basically what he had in his hand, he thought he still had it when the other guy took it. 
He thought he had what he originally had, but the other guy took it. And he said, no, look again, and it was something different the whole time because it got taken. And there's a lot of things. There may be something that you've been holding on to uh, that you learned in church or that you learned as a kid that you've been hanging on to that if you look more closely, it's not a truth, it's a lie. Man, and I was like, Hold, you know, smack me in the face. You know what that means? That I've got, I've got to test what I hear and what I think I know with the word of God. I've got to get the textbook back out to know if I'm really believing the truth or if I've been, it's been swapped out for a lie along the way. This is why, this is why it doesn't say faith, faith came by the word. It says faith comes by the word, okay? It, it's a present thing. It happens then. It comes by the word. Another thing uh, we talked about, have I written down what God has said to me? Do you all remember week one we had notebooks and pens and pencils out there? Have I written down what God said to me? Or am I just going about my life trying to live off of someone else's word? Am I trying to cheat off of my neighbor's notes? They t- I'm, I'm going to rely on my neighbor's notes to help get me through something. You know, that's not going to work when a test comes up in your life. You know what that's called? It's called cheating. And and here's the deal. The the, the test that that they're taking is probably different from the one you're taking, and so the word that God gave them for that isn't going to work for you. You better have your own word. You better have your own word from God. It'll all come from the word, but it'll be his word to you for right then for whatever you're going through. And I know I'm going to get up on my high horse, but this is a good high horse to be on, and we've talked about this. It's, very, it's a very practical thing that, that he thought that we should supply pens and notebooks and everything. And my thing is, every single one of those should have been taken. Now, me, uh, I, I take notes on my phone. There's this really cool app on your phone. It's already there when you get it. It's called Notes. It's already called that for you. If, if you're coming to church and you are not taking a note of any kind at any point, you, there is no expectation that you came with then. You've heard the saying, and he's mentioned it in this series, uh, the dullest pencil is better than the sharpest mind. What, what, what you don't write down, you will forget. Don't tell me about how good your memory is. You'll forget it. And not only that, you not writing it down proves how valuable you thought that it was. Okay, so I write down what I think is valuable. When the teacher's going over something in class, and I know that it's going to be on a test, I better be writing down what I'm hearing because there's going to come a time when I need to refer back to that and study and get ready for the test that's coming up. Come on now. And so it baffles me a little bit to see how some of us don't take a note at all. We don't take a note at all. Guys, you, you got to take a note. I don't, I don't care if it's one word that you write down. So long as you have the expectation and have something to take a note on, God will meet you at the level of your expectation and he will give a word to you. It may not be anything that I say, but your expectation allows the Holy Spirit to bring his word to you at the time that you need it. And it leads into what we had talked about last week, and I'll, I'll go back to uh, week two here in a second, what we talked about last week about being present but not accounted for. you got to be present and accounted for. And a lot of us are coming into the doors of the church on Sunday morning. I'm here. I'm here. And we're not accounted for because we're, we're not actually getting what's being taught. You know, one of the things he said, too, that, that really hit me, because this has happened a lot. Did I, did I come to church to hear a preacher or what's being preached? I, I mean, I, I got to come for, for the textbook. I'm coming to be built up together with my classmates, with the body of Christ, so that we can hear the same word, so that we can be advancing together, right? And, and we, need to become, we need to come prepared to hear God's word. And so for us to just walk through the doors and not take a note, not have any expectation for me to come in next week, or let's, let me say this, for me to come in eight weeks from now and to have no recollection of what we talked about eight weeks ago, I can't find that anywhere. I was not accounted for. I can't be accounted for eight weeks ago. You've got to be present and accounted for 
How are you going to be accounted for? I know what happened eight weeks ago in class. I've got record of it. There's record of it. Come on. Uh, Week two, we'll go back to week two. Week two, we talked about, anybody remember what that was about? Write your name on everything. That's right. Put your name on it. How many of you still do this? How many parents have little kids that you write their name, you get a Sharpie out, and write their name on the inside of all their stuff? Cool, no one. That's always fun to do that (laughs) in church. Oh, sorry, at one. Thank you, Twyla. Appreciate that. And you got those ones who are like, yeah, I do that, but I'm not raising my hand because I'm not going to do that. You know that that's one of the ways that you show that you're accounted for? The teacher sees you. I see you. Oh, I hear you. You're here. You're here. Uh, My wife does this. I don't know if she still does it. I'm assuming she does because of one of our daughters, but her name's in everything. In everything. Which one? We'll find out. In everything, right? And, and we're like, where, where is your, you know why? Because every year there's about 37 things in the lost and found at school that is our daughters. <laughs> so you have to, like, you wear a jacket, and, we're, and we say 40, 42 times, bring your jacket home from school. We pick her up. Where's your jacket? I left it in, I left it in class. Where's your jacket? Or I don't know, you know. You better write your name on it. And so the, the point that week was when you hear the word of God, this is, this is the whole point about school too. When you apply yourself and when you take a note, when you hear what God says to you, he, he's saying it to you. Write your, God's writing your name on it, okay? Yeah. It's for you and you need to make it yours. Yeah. Make it yours. Write your name on it. One of the other things that he, that he had talked about that week that really kind of opened up obviously um, this, this series was a scripture, and I want to read it in Hebrews 11, 1, uh, from the Amplified, and I love how this reads. So this is, this is talking about faith. We know this is, this is talking about faith, the faith chapter. It says, now faith is the assurance. It's the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. It's the proof of the things we don't see and the conviction of their reality And we hit on this, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. And so sometimes, you know, you may not, if you've heard this before, if you've seen something in the Amplified Bible, you're like, that's a big word salad. I don't really know what's being said there. How many of you have thought that before? I have. Um, Thank you. We've got some more honesty on that one. I appreciate that. But but here's the deal, and what drives this home uh, is faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. Faith is a real thing, okay? It's a real thing. And to the believer, uh, we must know that this is a real thing, okay? And it is more real than what we can perceive with our senses. Uh, I love how it mentions the title deed. I actually just, I paid off my truck not too long ago, and the bank called and said, yeah, yes, thank you, Lord. And, uh, and they said, hey, we got, your, we got the title here that you can come pick up. So I picked up the title the other day. And, you know, that truck... I can take that truck, and if I go try to go sell that truck, do you know that I couldn't without what? Without the title. It's like it's not even mine unless I have the title. In fact, before it got paid off, was it really mine? Not all of it. Part of it, maybe, you know. But do you really have it if you don't have the title deed? So what's more important, the object or the title? The title is. And so the title, the title deed comes first. What is the title? It's faith. It, it's the proof of the things that we don't see. And so what is more important is not the object of our faith, is not the manifestation of it. It is faith itself because it's required to ever see the manifestation of its end. The title deed. You have to have it. You have to have faith. So... That's what we had talked about a little bit in week two, and then we went over week three. Um, let's see, anything else in week three that was really good? It was all good. Um, let's see. Faith comes by hearing God's word, but it's released and activated when it's spoken and acted upon. So faith comes when we hear, but we release faith when we speak it and when we act upon it, right? Yeah. Very important. 
Very important. Otherwise, there's no outlet of it in our life at all. And so the, the thing talking about last week, and we had mentioned it a little bit already, is why it's so important that we are present and accounted for is because what will happen is we'll end up like this person who may have been holding a lie for so long. And th- the reason that happens is because a deceived person doesn't know they're deceived. Right? Like if they knew they were deceived, they, they would do something about it. And so I, if, if I'm deceived and I don't know anything about it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go on the way that I was. And this is why it's so important not just to show up, but to be accounted for in ways that proves I was here. I, I have whatever I need to pass this test that just came my way. I was here. I was accounted for, right? So this morning, week four, we're going to talk about something that it's applicable to everyone. It's applicable to where you are right now. It's not, you know, it's a very, it's a, such a good um, example uh, for, for school, back to school, but just for you now in your life. And what we're talking about this morning is, is getting ready for school, getting ready for school, like, every, like not just back to school in August, like getting ready for school come Tuesday morning this week. Like how many of you have morning routines when school's back in session? It looks a little different than it did in summer or whatever. You have a routine. There's something that you do each morning when getting ready, right? And that's going to look a little different for everyone, but the main point of what we're going to talk about today is that your approach and prep the morning before, before you get to class is the most vital part of your day, is how you approach it in the morning. I mean, think about this, uh, you know, and if you, got, you were a kid once, you went to school, or if you got kids right now, th- this is very important how your day is starting, you know, like how much, how much sleep, you know, kids have a bedtime, or they should have a bedtime up to a certain age, and they need to be getting a certain amount of sleep. Guess what happens if they don't get a certain amount of sleep? Yeah, that, that's, that goes for all of us. Guess what happens if you don't get a certain amount of sleep? You're grumpy, you're cranky, you're a seven dwarf. You're one of those dwarfs who it's, something's going wrong, right? And, and so uh, you, you get into the morning, it is hot. I got hot. Are y'all hot? Which, yeah, I know no one up here is hot. It's an ice box up here every morning. And I finally dress warm and I'm up here moving around like a maniac. Um, but what goes on in the morning is super important. You got to get up. You got you've got to wake up on time. This is really important. You have to wake up on time. It, what am I eating for breakfast? What am I wearing today? Right? Uh, what you know? Are there? Do I have? Do I know where any of the fourteen pairs of shoes I own? Do I know where any of them are? Are is there is there one pair of socks in this house that actually matches? You're thinking about these things on Monday morning. Is it spirit week? Do I got to dress in all black? Do I got to dress in all pink? Do I got to dress like a cowboy? Do I, have I packed my lunch? What are they having for, for lunch at school? I need to know right now because if I don't like it, I want to I take my lunch. What are we having for breakfast? And so there's a lot of stuff going on in the morning that if it's not sorted out, uh, it, could be, it could either be good or it could be messy, right? And so we all have our routines, but our approach to each day is vital in how it sets the tone for how the day should go, okay? This is really important. And yet there's one thing, there's one thing that is most important for getting ready each day, just naturally getting ready for each day, uh, and also it's the most important thing in living a life of faith, okay? So there's a big parallel here. It's the same thing. And here's the foundation, is Uh, the foundation for getting ready, the foundation for living a life of faith is this. It's knowing, it's understanding, and it's declaring, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? This is what we're talking about today. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is the foundation. This is the most important thing to start your day. Whether you're going to school, whether you're going to work, whatever you're doing, If you want to live a life of faith, this is something that you must have and something that you must know. It's not something that you just should know, too. It's something that you must declare and say and remind yourself of every single day. We have to be confident in who we are and live with this understanding that my righteousness in Christ is what my identity should be centered around. Identity is a big deal in the world today. 
And this right here for the believer is the most important thing. Your identity should be centered around one thing and one thing only. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's it right there. Okay? And so you can go through your morning routine. I don't, I don't remember much of the, my morning routine growing up at school. Pastor Nate seems to be good at remembering this stuff. You mom, you might know. My mom was great. She made breakfast a lot for us. That's basically the only thing I remember, right? I wake up and I'm like, we're having, there's, I can go down to the, to the counter there and she's making some type of breakfast and, you know, I'm hammering biscuits and gravy or malto meal. How many of you eat malto meal? Y'all know what that is? But you got to eat malto meal with some butter in it and a lot of sugar. If you don't put sugar in it, like, I don't know, that's just, why are you, what are you doing, right? You got to put a lot of sugar, and you put sugar in to taste. So it's like, if it's not sweet enough, you put a little more in. Um, and you get some buttered toast, and this is a healthy breakfast, by the way. You, buttered toast and sugary malto meal, and I'm telling you what, on those cold days, though, it kind of sticks, that's that type of stick to your rib breakfast that you really, that you're really looking for. Uh, it was so good. But I remember we did that, like, I, sadly, I don't, we don't do that a lot for our kids. We're like, I don't know, man, we got cereal in there. Go figure it out. You know, you know how to, you know how to get a bowl out and pour it in there? How many of you are like that? Come on, I'm not, thank you. Oh, praise the Lord. All right. Sometimes, uh, we got yogurt today. Hey, there's yogurt in there. Go nuts. You know, we got nuts. Put the nuts in the yogurt. All right. Uh, and so I, I don't know what your routine looks like. Um, it, you know, I, like I mentioned, I've got two daughters. One of them, one of them gets up before I do and is ready and sitting ready to go uh, before I'm ready to go, right? This will be my oldest. And she's ready, and it's amazing. You know what? It's amazing when you have a kid who's like, you don't have to tell them how to do some of that stuff. They just do it now. <clears throat> but then the Lord's like, but I'm going to give you this other kid. And they're going to be the exact opposite of that. <laughs> and when I, she's the one who, what, where's the socks? I, you have all these shoes. Where in the world are they? True story. Before they walked out of the house this morning, they were supposed to leave. And Courtney said, I, I, don't, she's, I don't know where her shoes are. We've got to find her shoes. They're looking for her shoes. She's looking in our closet for her shoes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how that happened. They're all wearing the same size now, which is, that's funny too. Um, but... So we've got a lot of different things going on, and we're ha- I'm having to help this, and the other one's ready to go. Um, but here's one thing. Whatever happens in the morning, whatever happens that morning, whether it's a good morning, whether it's a rough morning, once we finally get in the truck and get to school, hopefully in time to get them there on time, it'll all culminate in one thing, whether we're mad, because there's been, how many of you have mornings where you're just mad, and I'm like, I'm a grown adult, and I'm not talking to my dang kids right now. I don't want to talk to them. Just me. Perfect. All right. All right. Thank you. Like, I, I don't want to talk to y'all. Just, we're going to be quiet, and I'm going to push you out when we get to school, and it'll be better later. Uh, no, don't do that. And so, but there's one thing it can culminate in, and we do this thing, and I've talked about it from stage before, but we do this confession. We confess God's word, and we confess something over them every day. And so you can kind of bring it all back and salvage the morning by getting God's word in your mouth and in your kid's mouth and confessing something, okay? And it goes like this, and it's something that they have heard, they were taught, and they may still be doing in kids' class back here. And it it goes like this. We say this together. I'm ready to be taught the word of God today. I have eyes that see and ears that hear the truth, right? How does it go after that? I forgot. We say this every day. What? What? Okay, that's what I got to do. I'm ready to be taught the word of God today. I have eyes that see and ears that hear the truth. I hear and obey because I'm a doer of the word. I am who God says I am, and I can do what he says I can do. His word is working in my heart, and I will never be the same. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Okay, and that's something that they learned back here in Beyond Kids class. And we say that every day. You know, that'd be important for you to say with your kids every day. The Lord will fulfill. And this isn't me saying that to them. This is me confessing that about for me. This is them confessing this for them. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. And we don't stop there. We take some other scriptures and we make it our own. We say, I'm smart. I'm sharp. 
I have the mind of Christ. I'm a good learner. How many of you know your kids might need to hear that they're a good learner? You know they'll never be a good learner if it doesn't start coming out of their mouth, and they believe that that's who they are. They have to begin to identify with what they're saying. They're good. They, they are identifying with what they're saying and with what they're hearing. So let's make sure that they're saying and hearing the right things. I'm a good learner. I make lots of friends. I'm a good friend. <clears throat> I'm a leader, and I'm an influence for the kingdom. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I'm increasing this is things that we say. I'm strong in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Man, this is, this is how the morning should go. And one of the things, and we do say I am who God says I am, but we're gonna get more specific. This is the direction that I've been given, and I'm gonna do it for my life too because it's something that I know. This is something I know. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If that's not coming out of my mouth every day though, then it's an identity that I am not identifying with as much as I need to be. It is the most important thing in your life. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is the foundation to live a life of faith. So going back to faith school, we're talking about faith, we're talking about living by faith. You will never, ever, ever live by faith the way God intended until you are convinced every single day that you are his righteousness in Christ Jesus. We're going to define what that is and talk about it because it's super important for how we identify, okay? Y'all ready to get into it? Yes. All right. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> Galatians 5. And we're going to read verses 2 through 6. Uh, this is in the NLT. Listen! That's how that reads. All right. That's what it says. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. Paul just told us to listen really loud. Then he's going to repeat it. Is this important? If you're trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves, say make yourselves. If you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. So my being and doing cannot make me righteous. It cannot make me righteous. Righteous. Righteousness is a gift. Okay? And, I, and I'll probably get a little ahead of myself today. That's, gonna, that's okay. But I'm going to go ahead and just define righteous just so as we're going through this, you know what this means. Righteousness is being able to stand before God as though you've never sinned. Righteousness is being able to stand in the presence of God, and when he looks at you, he, he sees Jesus, okay? It's, as though, it's, it's not as though he knows about all of your past sins, but, and he accepts you. It's, 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 he's looking at you as though you've never sinned. You can stand in his presence with no feeling of inferiority. This is what, does anybody want that? This is so important. It's so important. I want to read in Romans chapter 5. We're going to read about righteousness and how it's a gift. This, these set of scriptures mention the word gift a lot. It says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came, uh, and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Ooh, thank you, Lord. This is really good. I'm gonna try not to just camp out here. It says, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness, this is the gift he's talking about, righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Whew. Hey, let me ask you something. Do you earn gifts? 
Do you earn your birthday gifts? No, congratulations, you were born. Like, what? we say happy birthday like, like a, as a congrats. Like, that person had nothing to do with them being born. Here's some gifts. You know, I've told this kind of gross thing. When, I, when it's my birthday and my dad tells me happy birthday, I say, thanks, dad. And he says, it was my pleasure. And I'm like, gross. <laughs> but I, that's the thing. It's like telling me happy birthday. I didn't do anything. Here's some gifts. Did I earn those gifts? No, we don't earn birthday gifts. The moment... <laughs> Every year. I don't know. The moment that, that I begin to think that I can or I'm going to earn something, it, it is no longer a gift. It's now what I believe is owed to me and what I deserve. Righteousness is a gift. It can't be earned. And, and if you say, duh, I know righteousness is a gift and I can't earn it, then why do you draw back from God when you mess up? So if righteousness isn't something that you earn... Why do you think you have to earn your way back when you mess up? Oh, this is good preaching here. So a lot of us will say, I know, righteousness is a gift. I don't have to earn it. That's great. And yet, when I screw up, I draw back from God. Because I think, what, is it because I think I'm not righteous? Well, maybe not, but but. Thinking I'm righteous knowing, and knowing I'm righteous is different than acting like I'm righteous. This is a huge thing. I can think it, I can know it, but if I'm not acting like it, it doesn't do me any good. We, you, we can go through tons of examples like this. If I know that I have millions of dollars in the bank and I've been left in inheritance, but I don't do anything with it, is it doing me any good? No, it's like I don't have it at all. So it can't change how I act. I didn't earn my right standing before him to begin with so it doesn't change when I miss the mark. Someone needs to hear this today. Your, your standing with God doesn't change when you mess up. We're going to go a little deeper into this too. So it doesn't change my standing of righteousness before the Father. Galatians 5.4, what we read a second ago, if I'm trying to make and keep myself, look, this is what it's talking about, right with God by what I do, then it says, Christ was of no benefit to me. And so I didn't earn it to begin with, and now if I'm trying to make myself right with God somehow or keep myself this way, I am making Christ of no benefit to me. Man, that's not a place I want to be. He was all the benefit that I'll ever need. And now I'm putting him away saying, no, I'll figure out a way to get back. I'll make this right, God. I'll make this right. You never made it right to begin with. I never made it right to begin with. Um, and this, this is a good parallel here. So many of you may know, but uh, Courtney, we adopted both of, our, both of our girls. You know what that means? We chose them. We chose them. And there's nothing that they could do ever. There's nothing that they could ever do that would not make them my daughter, right? You say that about your own kids. There's nothing that your kids could do that would not make them your kids, Nothing. Yet, and do we think that we're a better parent than God? Do I think that I'm a better father than God? So there's nothing that I can do. If I've been born into the family of God, there's nothing that I can do that would take me out of the family of God. I'm always going to be his kid. Always. And so just because, just because if, if one of my daughters messes up or they're going through a rough patch... Does that, did, were they ever not my daughter? No, they were the whole time. The whole time. You, they have the same standing with me the entire time. So I have the same standing with God no matter what I'm going through. If I've been born into his family, you know, God has adopted each and every one of us into his family. He calls you his own. It's amazing. God created you. You're his because he created you, and you're his twice because he bought you back. He adopted you back. Oh, man. You can't, you can't get out. We think, that we think that we're just like, what we do, what you do didn't get you in. What you do can't take you out. You're his. You're his. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18. 
God's adopted us, made us his own. He sees us through the blood of his son and counts us the same as Jesus. This is good. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm going to read this from the Passion. It says, Now if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh and new. And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. So in verse 17, it's saying all that is related to the old order has vanished. Here's what the old order includes. Our old identity, our life of sin, the power of Satan, the religious works, trying to please God, our relationship with the world, our old mindsets, okay? So you got to understand that when you are born again, you are made new. You're not just reformed or simply refurbished. You're, you're brand new. We're made completely new by our union with Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Completely new. And, you know, we talked, there, there's this thing going on, and it's been going on for years now, identity politics. Like, it's an actual thing that's affecting politics, and it's because there's an identity crisis in the world right now. People don't know who they are. And sadly, this is happening for a ton of Christians. And so when a believer, let's just say any of us in here, when, when a believer is struggling with sin, it's a case of mistaken identity. Okay? And so when we're, when we're born again and we're made new, that doesn't mean that we become perfect. Because we still need the word to, what, transform our mind, right? The word is to transform our mind, and there's supposed to be an outflow from the inside out that changes what we do, how we live, and how we act, okay? Um, and so because we live in a world that's fallen and a world of sin, sin is all around. And so we have to, we're, we're made new from the inside, and it's to work its way out. This is why the Bible talks about working out your salvation, your salvation is secure, it's happened, but it's to come out and be worked out through what you do, through how you live, okay? And so when a believer is struggling with sin, they're having an identity crisis is what they're having. And I'm sure we've all been there at different times before. I mean, I certainly have, but it's the case of mistaken identity. And what happens is, is that they think that they're a dirty, rotten sinner, and as a result, they continue to live as a dirty, rotten sinner, Okay, again, this is an identity problem. But the more that we see that we've been made righteous apart from our works, the more we'll live empowered to live righteously. Okay, all right. I will have to go into this a little bit more then. Um, you're not a sinner saved by grace. I was watching some YouTube videos yesterday, and there are still numerous people who say, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. Biblically speaking, that's incorrect. You, we were all sinners, saved by grace. But if you've been saved by grace, you can no longer coin yourself a sinner. I was a sinner, and I was saved by grace. Okay? Somebody say, I was a sinner, now I'm saved by grace. So it... We just read in 2 Corinthians, you were made new. You're made new. You weren't, you weren't a sinner that was just somehow made a little bit better. You were made new. So it's incorrect for me to say that I'm still a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner, but I've been saved by grace. You know what that's called? I'm a saint now. Look at your neighbor say, I'm a saint. Look at your second choice and say, I'm a saint. I'm a saint you know why we don't use that word too often? Is because when we think of saint, we think of someone who's so good and so perfect. We've got an identity issue. You know that, that God had to change the name of many people in the Bible so they would identify with something different? He changed Abram to Abraham. He changed Jacob to Israel. Changed Saul to Paul, Cephas to Peter. Why? Why? He, had, he needed them to see and to hear something different when they heard their name. He had to give them a change of identity. Does it matter what you call yourself? It matters. It matters. If you, 
or say, well, I'm just, I'm just a sinner. Going back to this example, if I'm a dirty, rotten sinner and, and that's what I say that I am, I will continue to live by the identity that I've reinforced in my life. This is why if you're wanting to change your habits, your habits start with what you identify with. I am a person who works out. This is who I am. Uh, maybe I haven't worked out in years, but if I start identifying with that, I am going to begin to believe that I'm a person who works out and it will lend its, it, I will start finding my way to working out. Why? Because I've associated with that identity, okay? And so a lot of people, and, and, and I'm gonna get ahead of myself and I'm not going to because this is a really important point that I, that I wanna make, but I, I'm setting the stage here. We, we are having an identity crisis, a, mis, a case of mistaken identity when there, we're a believer who's struggling with sin. We must go back to this right here. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That, what I did, is not who I am. Who I am is who Christ has made me because of his finished work, okay? This is important language, and we're gonna read it here, that word made. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a few verses down, this is my favorite scripture in the Bible. For God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us. So that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. Oh, thank you, Lord. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we who didn't know righteousness could now become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He has made us. We have become that. I love what this says here. Uh, There's a footnote in the Passion Translation, and it says this. It says, this one verse is perhaps the greatest verse in the New Testament to describe our salvation through the sinless Savior and his substitutionary death on the cross. You know, Jesus was our substitute. He took our place. That, that was our cross that we were to go and, and to pay the payment for our sins, and he became our substitute and did it for us, for everyone. This was a wonderful divine exchange took place at the cross. All of our sins were left there. Our guilt was removed and forever gone. And we walked away with all of God's righteousness. What bliss is ours. Every believer today possesses the perfect and complete righteousness of Christ. We are seen by the Father as righteous as his Son. Guys, this is amazing. Have you heard this before? Have y'all heard this before? Are we living like we've heard it before? This This is the point this morning. You are just as righteous as his son. If you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you have put your faith in Jesus, God looks at you just like he looks at Jesus. Just the same. We were made righteous. Say, I was made righteous. In Romans 5, um, we already read some of it, but really what it's talking about is this, and again, this is going to go back to identity. Sinners are not sinners because they sin. Y'all, y'all hang with me here, okay? Sinners are not sinners because they sin. They're sinners because of one man's disobedience. Okay? Did we read this in Romans chapter 5? Because of one man's disobedience. This is why you hear and the Bible tells us that we were born into sin. Did you do anything wrong to be born into sin? No. I was born a sinner because of one man's disobedience a long time ago. Okay, And so sinners aren't sinners because they sin. They're sinners because of one man's disobedience. Therefore, they sin because they're sinners. They sin because they're sinners. And what's tough about this is that we're cause and effect people. Like, we understand cause and effect. Don't you understand cause and effect? Logic doesn't follow how we must receive grace. This is why faith is so important. It's a glorious effect that we didn't cause, okay? Grace is an effect that we didn't cause. It's by faith. So just like we were made sinners through someone else's sin, we were made righteous through someone else's righteousness, okay? You've got to understand that you are not a sinner because you sinned. You were born into it. It was because of one man's sin, one man's disobedience, that everyone who came into the world after was a sinner. But once you put your faith in Jesus and are born again, You are now made a new creation. You are made something else. You were made righteous. Made righteous. Are y'all tracking with me? 
This is the, good, this is the gospel that we're talking about. This, this is the good news right here. The good news that Jesus took all of your sin and gave you all of his righteousness. Oh, my gosh. Nobody has a higher standing before God than you do, including Jesus. I got one person who, who agrees with that. Is this not what we're reading? Nobody has a higher standing before God than you do, including Jesus, because God saw fit to put you in Christ. My goodness, guys, we would live so differently if every day we lived like Christ here on the earth. God has put me in Christ. I have the same standing before the God, the creator of the universe, as his son does. Oh, oh my goodness. So shouldn't this change my approach to life? It's, this should change my approach. In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, it says, The wicked flee as though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. How many of you have heard this? The righteous are as bold as a lion. Boldness is something that if you're righteous, we should be, we should be, uh, um, be being bold. Boldness should be a part of our life because we know that we're righteous, Right? Why are lions so bold? They're confident in who they are. They're the apex predator. They know they're at the top of the food chain and every other animal knows it too, right? That's why they can be bold. They, they are convinced and know who they are. And this is why we, we talk about lions being bold or courageous. We've got, a, we've got a picture in our office. Jake, if you have that, we've got a picture of a lion in our office and this is what we put on it. This is in our office up there. We are a courageous church. This is something that's associated with the lion. You see a lion pick out there by the water fountain, the same thing's going on it. We're a courageous, I mean, how many of you like that right there? We're a courageous church. We're a bold church. We know who we are. We know who God's called us to be, and we are going to do what God called us to do. We're not going to back down from it. We're not going to be ashamed of it. We're strong in the Lord. We're courageous. We're bold. This is how lions are. Your approach to life is found in who you believe you are. How you approach life is all about who you believe you are. Coming boldly to the throne of grace requires us having a reality of righteousness. We will not come boldly. Hebrews 4, uh, you can go ahead and put Hebrews 4 up. We will not come boldly to the throne of grace as we're told to if we don't have a reality that we're righteous. We won't do it. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest uh, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Thank you, Jesus. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then. So this is saying, because Jesus went through everything that we went through, but he did not sin, and he's now become our high priest, it says, let us then, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So my approach to God's throne should be solely based on 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin was made sin so that those of us who did sin could be made righteous. He made me righteous. So because he made me righteous, I can come into the throne room of God boldly like I belong there because I do. And I can, I can come in there with no feeling of inferiority at all because he, when he sees me, he sees Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're belittling the blood of Jesus when we think, say, and act like we're unworthy to come into God's presence. Let me say it again. We're belittling the blood of Jesus when we think, when we say, when we act like we're unworthy to come into God's presence. Man, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus was more than enough. The blood of Jesus is the most powerful agent in the history of the universe. It it, it was. It is. It's more than enough. 
and to put my screw up on a pedestal above the blood of Jesus, come on, we, I can't be doing that. I can't be doing that. I love Pastor Nate left. He had so many. He has so many notes for this series and the, the next few weeks too. But he had some for here too that he'd shared with me. And he's obviously far more be, like better with analogies, anoint, like anointed, like to the point where there's so many analogies. I'm like, Jesus, just tell us plainly. Stop talking in parables, right? <laughs> tell us what are you? What do you mean? Just say it. I said this the other day in an analogy he was using. I'm like, what, what, what's the milk again? I, don't, I, I got lost. He was using some milk as an analogy. I'm like, where, what are we talking about here? Um, but he had this analogy. It's so good. Uh, my shirt is not me. Okay? <laughs> is, do y'all, y'all, y'all understand that? My shirt is not me. Your shirt is not you. Look, if my shirt gets dirty, it does not change who I am. Okay? It doesn't change who I am. So, like, you're in the school cafeteria, and you get your little pint of chocolate milk that, you know, when you drink, you taste all the cardboard stuff first, right? Oh, used to like that, but now I'm like, I can't do it. I'm like, you go to IHOP, I'm like, man, or Cracker Barrel, I'm like, can y'all just trick me and put it into a glass before you come out? Like, if I know it came out of this, I'm just going to taste that same cardboard taste, knowing that it came out of here. But if I spill that chocolate milk on me... Just because I spilled chocolate milk on me doesn't mean that that changes who I am. When I'm getting ready in the morning and and I'm brushing my teeth and it falls on me, just because I got toothpaste on my shirt doesn't change who I am. Yet that might have changed our approach for the day if we didn't have time to change because now we're having to show up with stuff all over our shirt. Right? So follow me here. Like in the Old Testament, you know what they did when, when they got something on their shirt? It's called a sacrifice of atonement. And all that means is that they just put something over it and covered it up. And their sins were just covered. But in the New Testament, by the blood of Jesus, it tells us that we have the remission of sins. You know what remission is? When someone has cancer and they go into remission, it's because they can't find any cells, any trace of cancer in their body. They're in remission. They're, it's, like, it's like using a, you get that chocolate milk, it's like using one of those Tide sticks on your shirt and it's the best tie stick ever, and when they look, it looks like a brand new shirt, like nothing ever at all happened to it. There's not even, there's not even like a wet looking spot from you doing it, it's like it's just, it's a perfectly white shirt. The remission of sins. This is what we have. This is what we have. Well, I know, I know, I know that, that when I got born again, I was a sinner, and, and, I, and all that was true. But when I got born again, I was made righteous, but, but then I sinned, and I, I spilled stuff on my shirt again. How many of you know that once you get born again, you're going to sin and mess up still? You're going to get stuff on your shirt. Does that change who you are? No, hold on a second. In the Old Testament, you just had to put a coat over it. Then you had to come back and put another coat over it. Then you had to just keep layering up and covering that sin up. But in the New Testament, you have the rem- it's gone. It's completely gone. It's gone. It's not there anymore. And, and even and even the the residue, the 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 stain, the water spot that it might leave, the guilt, the shame that sin would leave, that's gone too. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. And so even the effects of sin, Jesus has taken care of for me. Glory to God. Here's what he says in, in 1 John 9. If I'm born again, I'm a new creature, and I get some chocolate milk on my shirt. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins, and he will purify us from all unrighteousness. Purify us. The Passion Translation says this way. If we freely admit our sins when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us every time. Every time. God is just to forgive us our sins. Why? Why? Because of Christ. He, he is just. To, he's just. He's, he's right. He's right to do it because of Christ. And he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many times did Jesus tell Peter that he was to forgive his brother? How, what does math tell us that is? 490 times. 490 times. I'm to forgive 
my brother or sister if they wrong me? Do, does the Bible say that the mercies of God are new every morning? Hold on, hold on. If God tells us to do something, wouldn't he have to be able and willing to do that too? So if his mercies are new every morning, then there's 490 times a day that he would do this right here. The point is, he'll do it every time. This is the point. Every time. It's in the other verse, but it said every time. Every time. Because of Christ, he will continue to do it. Oh, glory to God. This is good. This is good. He's faithful to forgive us every time. And people are like, well, well, doesn't just knowing this stuff give people a license to sin? Brother, people are sinning without a license all over the place. No one's going to the DMV to get their license to sin and getting after it. People are just doing it, okay? It goes, to back, it goes back to identity. When I know this right here, this, this makes me turn to God when I mess up instead of go the other way. That's the whole point. It's a change in identity. I have to identify as the righteous. If you have a bad habit in your life, if there's some type of sin going on in your life, when you sin, right when you sin and mess up, I want you to say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But I just sinned, but I just messed up. What does that have to do with who you are? The more that you identify with who you are, even after you, you did this bad habit, this bad thing, you missed the mark, you sinned, you are going to begin identifying, no, well, you know, next time that comes up, no, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. What if you miss it again? I'm the right, are you lying to yourself? Come on, are you trying to believe a lie? No, 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 you're believing the truth and you're identifying with the truth that God said about you. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And what you'll find out is your behavior will begin to take shape after your identity. Your behavior will change because you identify differently. People want their behavior to shift and to change uh, so that they can identify a certain way and that's not how it works. You declare who you are in Christ and your behavior will follow suit. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Living a life of faith requires the foundation of us knowing we are righteous because of Jesus. It requires it. I cannot live a life of faith without knowing and employing in my life that I am righteous because of Jesus. Mark Hankins said it like this, my identification with Christ is the place where my faith functions the best. My identification, my identification with Christ is the place where my faith functions the best. So when I'm getting ready for school, when I'm getting ready for my morning, this goes for all of us. Everybody in here, you're going to have a tomorrow morning. You're going to have a Tuesday morning. You're going to have something that you do that day. My suggestion to, suggestion to you would be to start that day by declaring who you are and identifying with who God calls you. This is the number one thing we need to do, and I mentioned this earlier, but being righteous and living like you're righteous are two different things. I'll never live like I am until I remember, I confess, I make it my mission to live out the gift that Jesus gave me. You, this is why faith, is, it, oh, I got faith on this. I heard this. I heard this. No, this is why you have to hear it every day. It has to be ingrained into who you are. Come on, y'all look, y'all look me straight in the eye and tell me that if you said every day, multiple times a day, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, you wouldn't kick any sin habit that you had in your life. I guarantee you, you would. You'll identify as someone different than that person. And so we, the point is, we may know this. We may know that we're righteous. We've got to remember it. And, you know, this example came up, and we've actually done this years ago in a series Pastor Nate did and showed this, but it came to my mind. In fact, we watched The Lion King not too long ago, the, the newer one, the one in 2019, and it brought it to my mind, um, the scene that we're about to watch here, I want to show you. We've got to remember who we are. S Simba was somebody, or Pastor Nate would call him Zimba. Zimba, I don't know. <laughs> few of you were here for that. Simba, he, he was the, the child of a king, and he was the next king. He forgot who he was. Yeah. Can we, let's just, do we have that? Can we play that real quick? Let's watch this. 
Your father is waiting. Do you see him? I don't see anything. Kuala Selama. Look closer. You see? He lives in you. Simba. Simba, you must take your place in the circle of life. I can't. You must remember who you are, the one true king. I'm sorry. I don't know how to be like you. As king, I was most proud of one thing, having you as my son. That was a long time ago. No, Simba. That is forever. Please, don't leave me again. I never left you. I never will. Remember who you are. Remember. And so, I ask again, who are you? I am Simba, son of Mufasa. Gotcha, didn't you? You didn't, you forgot about that part a little bit, huh? Plus, James, if we could get just James Earl Jones to just voice over some of this stuff, you know, <laughs> narrate our life, it may be like that a little bit, too. That guy. Remember who you are. Man, you got to remember who you are. When he remembered who he was, it changed how he lived. It made a change in how he lived just by remembering who he was. Who he was. We've got to remember who we are. Amen? Amen? The power of the gospel is to, lead, to live each waking moment having the confidence that your sins have been forgiven. This is the power of the gospel, that you can live each day knowing that your sins have been forgiven. Amen? Let's stand this morning. Did you get something from today? Something that, that we need to take when we, growing back to faith school, this is vital and it's key. It's the foundation. And we'll never live a life of faith. We'll never walk by faith consistently until we know, remember, and live like this is true. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He made me that way. When I was born again, he made me righteous. And I can stand before God with no feeling, no sense of inferiority, because Jesus can. And I'm in him. So can I. Amen. Let's say this together. I am who God says I am. I can do what he says I can do. I am the righteous, righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. One more time. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Never forget it. it it's not a long time ago. It's forever. It's forever who you are. And it will, it will, it will change your behavior and shape it the way that you've always dreamed it could be because you'll identify with who you truly are. You're a king's kid, that's who you are. You're adopted into the family of God. He loves you, 
His love for you isn't changing. There's nothing you can do or say that's gonna change your standing with him. There's nothing that, that you did that got you into that place to begin with. You just placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for Jesus that you gave him as a gift for us. That he paid the price for, for our sins. The wages of sin was death and Jesus came to become our substitute. He took our place, paid our wages and exchanged all of his righteousness, all that he was and he gave it to us. So that now we can stand before you as though we've never done anything wrong. So Lord, we do, we approach your throne boldly to receive mercy and to find grace, your empowerment, your power, all that we need to live a life that's pleasing to you. And that life is a life of faith. So I just thank you, Father, for that reality, the reality of your righteousness, of who each person is, taking root in our hearts, that we walk out of this place and every single day know who we are. We are your righteousness because of Christ. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We honor you. We give you praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I want to take one moment before we dismiss. This may be for you. This may be for someone watching online, but maybe you never got to that point where you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you're, you're not born again or made new and a new creature. You know, that's the first part. You know that you can confidently believe that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus when when you've placed your faith in Jesus. That has to be the first thing you do. But once, once you've done that, that's it. You're now righteous. So if you haven't made that step and you wanna, you wanna make that step today, I just wanna let you know that, that we're gonna be up here. There'll be a few of us up here. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you wanna rededicate your life to the Lord, we'll be up here and can pray with you. If you're online, I'd encourage you, we've got resources on our website where you can go do this where you can do this. And it's real simple. It's real simple. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, and the Bible says you'll be saved. That's it. You just then, in that, in that moment of faith, exchanged all of your sin for all of his righteousness. Thank you, Lord. He's good, isn't he? He's a good God. Well, we love you guys. Y'all have a great holiday weekend. Be safe, and we'll catch you here on Wednesday night. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. If you need prayer, feel free to text us at the number on the screen below. You can also send us an email to info at beyondchurch.org or submit a prayer request form on our website at beyondchurch.org. If you'd like to partner with us in preaching Jesus, you can give securely online through our app or website, or if you prefer to mail your gift, send it to the address shown below. Stay connected with us throughout the week. You can download the app for all of our latest messages and announcements, and be sure and follow us on our socials at Beyond Church. If you've never attended in person, we highly encourage you to plan a visit. You'll never regret prioritizing godly community. We love you and hope to see you soon.